welcome everyone to our latest installment of Webinar Wednesday. Um, uh, today's uh, presentation is going to be put on by our Public Safety Communications Coordinator, uh, Dorothy Spearstein, and is really going to talk about uh, our plan for next generation uh, 911 deployment over the next five years. Uh, she did a similar presentation to the um, or, sorry, the 911 Services Board at their meeting, and we also uh, presented and discussed it with the Regional Advisory Council. And it's really important that, that we, we want to keep putting it out there in different venues to give opportunity for input, to give opportunity for discussion, uh, to make sure that everyone has an idea of what we're proposing or what's it being planned for. Please remember to mute your microphones. Uh, somebody's having a, a side conversation, um, but please go ahead and mute your uh, microphone so that uh, the rest of the group uh, can focus on the presentation. Uh, but this uh, uh, is important because it is a bit of a change of direction from where we've been in the past. Uh, we had talked about a, a year or so ago uh, in the 2000. Uh, 16 General Assembly session pushing for legislative changes as it related to governance and then coming back in 17 to discuss uh, the funding of Next Generation 911 and to really uh, make some more significant changes uh, to, to the legislative framework. That, that's not going to happen. Uh, it's taken us longer, and when I say us, I mean the entire community, not just Vita. Uh, to, to do the review of the costs and to understand what Next Generation 9-1 really means in the Commonwealth. So what Dorothy's going to present today is a, a revision of, of where we were going, um, provide us new direction and, and focus, and, and talk about uh, you know, where we're going. And uh, again, we want to do this, and we've done this presentation a couple times, and and it evolves as we as we go. And we will be uh, uh, Dorothy will be presenting it at the conference next week on uh, Friday, because we want this to be interactive and a conversation, and make sure that everyone understands and is comfortable uh, with the uh, with the direction and uh, the plan as it stands today. Uh, the 911 Services Board will be continuing to discuss the plans as we move forward in, in their meet, at their next meeting in uh, in November and, and January. Um, but again, this is one of your opportunities for input and feedback, and we'd really like to hear it. So with that introduction, I will turn it over to uh, Dorothy to, uh, to, to present the webinar Wednesday. Go ahead, Dorothy. Thanks, Dave. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this here this afternoon is to talk about Virginia's five-year NG911 deployment plan. And what I'd like to do is uh, give a 30-minute presentation and then leave some time at the end of the presentation for questions. Because as Steve says, this is an evolving process, and we want the entire stakeholder community to have an opportunity to hear uh, latest developments and to ask questions uh, about the planning process. So um, definitely we'll have time at the end of the presentation for questions. However, if you have a question during the presentation, you know, please feel free to jump in and, and ask that question on whatever slide we're on. Um, it, it doesn't uh, it disrupt me, and I'm sure if you're thinking about it, there's somebody else on the webinar that's thinking about it, so please jump in and ask your questions if you have them on, on any particular slide. To make this a meaningful discussion, what I wanted to do was to, to break um, a very uh, cumbersome subject, um, NG911, especially when you're talking about it over a five-year planning uh, time frame, into manageable topics. So um, I've broken the presentation down into, in, into four key areas. And the first one is what are the planning assumptions that have gone into our uh, five-year um, timeline for NG911? Um, I want to talk about the 911 funding analysis. This is something that I have been working with uh, about uh, actively for the past six months with the Regional Advisory Council. The supporting activities that are helping us with the deployment of NG911, focusing on our um, activities for calendar year 2016, and then talking about the planned activities for the next four years, and then closing out with um, a discussion on the legislation that will support this five-year planning process. 
So moving on to the, the planning assumptions, and uh, this slide captures um, a number of bullets about uh, the, the planning process. And, and Steve has already alluded to the first bullet that this is a, a fluid process, and, and we're focused on the long term. We are also focused on the entire 911 ecosystem. So although this is a five-year NG-911 deployment plan presentation, we'll be talking about the entire 911 ecosystem. Uh, the planning process will continue to evolve and it will be refined as new data becomes available. We're leveraging the results of the feasibility study, the comprehensive plan, and the work products of the Regional Advisory Council. I am 99.9% .9 certain that we will be using a service model approach for NG911. This means that it will not be an actual build-out of a state-run ESI net, but rather uh, we will be looking to obtain a vendor or a trusted partner through an RFP process, and this is scheduled to kick off in late 2016. Uh, the third bullet, uh, using 2020 population totals and national service provider benchmarks, um, we were, were fortunate in that um, we're able to, to leverage the results of the Northern Virginia RFI that was done this time last year uh, to look at um, benchmark estimates from national service uh, model providers. And this is very helpful in being, uh, being able to use the most up-to-date and accurate information. This is another reason why we're focusing on 2020 population totals, because this, this is a five-year plan, and we want to make sure that we're projecting for the future. So we're using the population totals that have already been collected through um, the RC's uh, 2016 um, locality uh, profiles. We're not expecting this to be a perfect estimate. Uh, it's a fluid process. We'll be revising it, but it will be in the ballpark. That means that whatever we we um, provide in terms of estimates will, will be a not to exceed. We also have to be prepared at the end of this journey that uh, we may need to be able, we may be required to work at our current funding levels if additional funding does not uh, become available. So that's something to consider and it's built into uh, the planning process. The transition model for NG911 services assumes that implementation projects will be based on selective router pairs. The reason for this is that is how our technology is organized. This is the most efficient and effective way to transition to NG911. However, we don't know at this point in time what is the most effective uh, queuing order when transitioning to the selective router pairs. I'm, I'm relatively certain that Northern Virginia will be kicking off the deployment process. They already have an open RFP process and are anticipating uh, deploying in early calendar year 2017. But how the rest of the state is organized in, in terms of which selective router pairs will go after Northern Virginia will have to be determined from uh, the RFP process to figure out what makes sense in terms of the most cost-efficient approach. And we can't uh, forget GIS, and this is a very important planning assumption. So there needs to be a statewide plan for data preparation for NG911 GIS data, uh, looking at QA, QC to make sure that um, we have accurate statewide data, and also how we coalesce regional data. Uh, many, uh, several of the regions are already looking at regional strategies so we want to make sure that our statewide approach takes into account those regional efforts. So moving on to the 911 funding analysis. Um, there are a number of pieces and parts to this funding analysis. Uh, the 911 baseline services and capabilities, the PSAP budgets for services and capabilities, uh, the revenue model, the deployment cost model for NG911, the gap analysis for the transition, and then closing out with the funding sources and sustainment model and the legislative and implementation strategy. And on the first slide with the planning assumptions, I, I um, mentioned that we're focusing on the long term and the entire 911 ecosystem. So we are including in this funding analysis um, cost components for NG911 as well as uh, sustainment of 
of the entire 911 ecosystem into the future. Looking at uh, the first item, the 911 baseline services and capabilities, uh, these are these are items that have been identified uh, through work with the Regional Advisory Council. We've had um, um, a number of calls and in-person meetings to talk about 911 baseline services and, and, and capabilities. And these are the primary swim lanes, if you will, that capture all of the operational and technical components of 911. And currently, they are 911 in operations, professional development, technical systems, data development, maintenance and support, and analysis and planning. So these are the primary swim lanes for 911 baseline services and, and capabilities. What we are attempting to do is figure out what are the individual, regional, and then statewide um, aggregated costs related to these baseline services and capabilities. So part of the funding analysis is to look at PSAS budgets for uh, these services and, and capabilities. So um, the Regional Advisory Council has focused on defining all of these individual swim lanes, and then we'll be looking to other members within the Regional Advisory Council to help flesh out um, what the PSAS budgets will be. Services and capabilities will be supported by best practices. We are moving to a more standardized approach to 911 services delivery, and this will help us to identify cost efficiencies and maximize effectiveness. And this moves us to the next item, which is the 911 revenue model. This model is looking at all known and relevant 911 funding streams. Uh, we have completed this, and when I say we, I mean the Regional Advisory Council and, and ISD staff. Um, and the SD 911 uh, deployment cost model is al also complete. This cost model includes beta and PISA cost items as well as legacy cost items. And we'll get more into uh, the specifics related to that in a couple of slides. So when you start talking about revenue and then you start talking about a deployment cost model, the next step is looking at gaps between the revenue and, and the cost. And what we're looking at in terms of the gap analysis is, is to determine how the current 911 funding streams can be maximized to support the transition to NG911 and the, the gap. And, and we have identified a, a funding gap. And when we talk about revenue and deployment costs, I'll, I'll be providing a, a number for, for that gap as it stands in terms of our current work. So after having gone through all of that, uh, the last two items lead us to finding sources uh, to address that gap, in, that gap. And then how are we going to sustain 911 after the deployment of NC 911? And what legislative and implementation strategy we will recommend to, uh, to bring that about. So moving on to the 911 revenue model. And on the previous slide, I broke down the funding analysis into the pieces and parts. I do want to spend just a, a few more minutes talking about the revenue model and the deployment cost model. So um, now that um, I've advanced the, the slides to uh, the 911 revenue model, what you see here on slide number five is a list of all of the identified revenue streams. So we have the compensation board, the communication sales and use tax. We have the wireless fund. This is the 60% of the wireless fund that goes to the PSAP in monthly disbursements. We have the wireless billing agreements that provide funding to Virginia PSAP for uh, wireless trunks and, and wireless services. There are um, um, installments coming from local government um, across the state for PSAP operations. In other words, there's, there's already an existing gap in terms of what's provided from the state that uh, the gap is filled by local government. We have the PSAC grant program that provides grants to locality for um, 911 um, equipment and services. And certainly there are, are other grant programs as well that the localities um, are, are tapping into. So those are the identified um, funding streams for the, the revenue model. I've included um, slide number six because 
um, the the bottom of that slide where you see milestone one current revenue. I wanted to, to demonstrate that, yes, we're looking at things from a statewide perspective, but we're also trying to break it down to the, the functional uh, elements and, and looking at it from a regional perspective and also looking at it from, from a PSAP perspective. So the, the revenue um, um, columns that you see on the bottom of that slide actually are based on the seven ISP regions. So um, this is just, just a way of having the, the revenue and, and, and the cost elements as well uh, meaningful in terms of the way we, way we currently operate. Moving on to the NG901 deployment cost model. Before we, we start talking about um, the, the actual cost associated with the, the model, I wanted to, 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 to do some level setting and talk about the considerations that went into developing this model. We started, and again, when, I, when I'm saying we, um, this is the discussions that have taken place with ISP staff, with the Regional Advisory Council, and, and to some extent with the 911 Services Board and the PSAP community as, as a whole, um, starting with the, the desired end state. And the desired end state is to have PSAP call routing that occurs through next generation 911 core services, which is supported by an ESI net capability. So that was the end state, the end state that we, we started with in terms of developing uh, the cost model. Um, and, and speaking plainly, um, that means that that end state is when the PSAPs are off the legacy selected routers. So in order to get there, we looked at several broad cost categories, and you can think of these as, as buckets, of, and, and you see some of these uh, depicted here. And those are non-reoccurring costs, recurring co costs, the preparation of GIS data into uh, an NG911 format, a CPE upgrade, text to 911, program management support, and I have a couple of other considerations on, on the next page, um, but before I move on to the, the next slide, um, I'll spend just a couple more moments providing just a bit more information in terms of the, the items here. Non-recurring -re cost, these, these are one-time costs. These are the one-time costs associated with setting up the ESI net, the IT background, uh, the NG901 GIS data preparations, uh, the selective router transition projects to the next generation 911 core services ESI net. So reoccurring costs are those one-time fees that I've just um, mentioned. Reoccurring costs uh, are related to the, the ESI net. And these are defined as um, the routing services and connectivity between each PSAP and the ESI net data centers. So uh, these are reoccurring costs associated with maintaining the network. The next item, preparation of GIS data into an NG911 format. We have included an estimate in the deployment model. Some needs have already been addressed. Uh, statewide with the PSAP grant program. We have had a number of NG-901 GIS data grants in the fiscal year 18 uh, PSAP grant application, so uh, we'll be doing some more work related to that. Um, but even after the 18 grants, there, there will, will still be additional work that, that needs to occur. And then CPE upgrades. Uh, again, there have been a number of, of grants going to localities to upgrade their CPE. Uh, there may be others out there, and we've anticipated that need, and we've also plugged in uh, existing grant awards to make sure we're capturing uh, the CPE upgrade cost component. We're identifying um, the upgrade based on the criteria that it would uh, need to have a TSAP CPE that is fully loaded and ESI net ready. So that is the definition that we're using uh, to, to assign cost to CPE upgrades. 
text to 911. Um, right now we're doing incremental deployments, but once we move to the NG911 environment, uh, text to 911 will be an application on, on the network. There are costs associated with that. We also have to factor in some program management support, and this includes um, basically um, consulting services to assist uh, the ISP with deploying NG911 in, in the Commonwealth. Some of the additional slides, uh, some of the additional uh, cost considerations on slide number eight, selected cloud or legacy costs, BIS IT support needed at the PSAT level, PSAT costs related to NG911 uh, staffing analysis, CAD expenses, and regional anomalies and uh, point of interface. Uh, the selective route or legacy cost, um, there I, I have a, a, a depiction of the cost model that uh, shows the selective router cost in terms of the savings that can be derived once localities or PSAS move off of the, the selective routers, uh, recognizing that GIS data, um, making it ready for NC911 is part of the effort, but we need to make sure that we have GIS and IT dedicated support at the PSAP level, not just for, for GIS data, but for IT support as, as well. Um, this is a lesson learned from early implementations that we did in, in Virginia with pilot projects from 2006, 2007, and 2008. And then making sure that um, personnel have um, the requisite uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities, and core competencies for NG911 and beyond. And, and we have um, a work group within uh, the Regional Advisory Council that is focusing on, on uh, staffing analysis. And if there are any additional personnel costs that need to be identified, we will make sure that they're included in the um, deployment model. And any related CAD expenses, and then the last point, regional anomalies, is looked at um, if we have to do any realigning of phone exchanges outside the selected route of tariffs for, for PSAP. And we, we do have some instances where that does occur um, in, in the Commonwealth. So I've mentioned several times that um, the deployment will occur on the um, selected router basis. And this slide, number nine, gives you um, an idea of the selective router groupings. If you look on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see the selective router group with letters uh, associated with the um, actual location of those selective routers. So this is the, um, the grouping that we'll be using to um, transition to NG911. And then on slide number 10, you will see um, the actual cost model. and. It took us uh, a couple of months to, to be able to distill all of the discussions that we had on, on regional advisory council work group calls um, to this summary um, slide. And basically, the top of the slide looks at cost from the PSAP and, and Zeta um, Side, and then the bottom looks at the um, looks at NG911 from the legacy cost perspective, and how those those costs are offset by transition. So, um, we're, we're the, the 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 title of, of this webinar today is the five year NG911 deployment plan. So we're using a, a five year um, budget to. Um, identify the costs associated with this deployment. One thing that we haven't um, provided with, with this webinar is looking at what happens in, in year six. So we're looking at uh, deployment across five years but um, and the costs associated with that, but we haven't provided um, an estimate in terms of what happens with, with year six. So um, looking at the top of this slide, we see that we have cost elements that are focusing on uh, PSAP transition costs as well as VITA ISP transition costs. And, and the VITA side of things is, is 
consulting resources. And from the PFAP transition side, these are items such as the annual reoccurring costs for ESI net routing services and um, ESI net circuit costs. Uh, selective router transition costs, uh, again, anticipated grant funding for call handling equipment projects, text to 911, and IT TIS support. So all of those uh, components are rolled into the totals that you see depicted for each selective router group in year one, two, three, four, and five. Um, and then for um, ISP, looking at the consulting side of it, um, trying to put some um, um, an estimate in there in terms of cost for for consulting services, we're estimating um, one million seven hundred and fifty thousand for for, um, for each of those five years. So that brings us to um, deployment cost for PTAS and and Vita ISP cost elements totaling just over $69 million. And on the bottom of the slide, um, in that um, um, table below with the, um, with the purple legacy source of router cost turned down estimate, that's the, the cost savings to be derived over the five years. So um, that, uh, carrying that, uh, those five years through to um, completion, it shows that um, the total savings would be 27, uh, just over $27 million. And you'll actually see year six depicted with the legacy selective round of cost. And that's because we're estimating that um, only 80% of, of the cost would actually occur in, in any year. In other words, there would be a 20% overlap in, in each transition year. So we would take until year six to actually recognize all of the cost savings. And that brings us to what is the actual gap when we look at um, the, uh, this cost model. And, and that gap is a little over 42, $42 million. And we'll try to go ahead and move on to discussing uh, the supporting activities and the legislative activity, I, I wanted to go ahead and stop and, and, and ask the group if they, they had any questions. I know I've been talking uh, for about uh, 20 minutes now, and that's a lot of information to, to digest. I've tried to keep it at a really high level, but before we talk about the activities and, and legislative efforts, I want to go ahead and pause and ask the group if you have any questions. Okay, looks like we have a question from what? I thought somebody raised their hand. I don't. Do you have a question? I'm here. I'm sorry. I had to remember the command to unmute the phone. I apologize for that. I do have a question. Yeah, if you can go back to slide number 10, please. I'm on slide number 10. The call, the call okay. summary? Slide number 9. Okay. There you go. Okay, so Verizon Selective Routers, I see that Fredericksburg slash Winchester is on here. Can you explain to me exactly what that means is going to happen with those tandems? Is, are they going to transition to 911 before, to NG911 before any of the other jurisdictions do? No. Um, the, the grouping on the left, on the left hand side doesn't depict a specific order. If you remember when I was talking about um, um, moving forward to an ESI net RFP, looking for a trusted partner, one of the things that we're going to be looking for in that RFP is for a vendor to tell us what is the most cost-effective solution for queuing the transition of the 
selective routers. So we know that we're going to start off with Northern Virginia because they've already planned for deployment in 2017. So the rest of the deployments will occur in, in the most cost-effective manner. What that is at this point in time, I don't know. Okay, fine. And, and the other reason why is I know a lot of jurisdictions have um, backup uh, PSAC capabilities to other jurisdictions, and we want to make sure that we're planning for that on a regional basis and that the state is aware of what those groups are so that if we've got to make other arrangements that we begin to do that now versus later, begin that planning process now. Absolutely, and we have done some work on the secondary PSAP uh, perspective, but certainly that would be another component that we would, we would be looking for input from um, our trusted partner once we start the, uh, the NG911 deployment process. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We're moving on. Moving on to supporting activities, um, I want to start uh, the, the discussion on supporting activities by, by first addressing what we have accomplished in, in 2016. Let me listen to this first. Hold on. This is too big. Just as a reminder, if you could mute your uh, phones. So in 2016, we, we have accomplished a, a number of, of very significant things. We have stood up uh, the Regional Advisory Council, and we've had a number of work products produced over the year. We have identified an approach uh, for best practices. We've stood up a steering committee for that. We have to draft best practices, and we've identified uh, a, a three other um, potential uh, best practices, and we'll be moving forward with that in conjunction with the Regional Advisory Council. We're looking at uh, data, data analytics. We've made a commitment uh, to um, establishing a statewide data analytics program to support uh, the 911 guiding principles and to provide funding for a standard reporting tool across PSAS that provide consistent and comparable data. We keep refining the set of requirements for um, the ESINet RFP. Uh, again, I mentioned that uh, we, we've leveraged the work of, of the Northern Virginia PSAP, and, and I personally am very grateful um, for, for the opportunity to work with them and, and for their willingness to share information. Uh, we've talked about a trusted, apart, trusted partner approach for a statewide ESINet RFP. Um, in the planning assumptions, um, I talked about the importance of GIS. We have conducted Commonwealth-wide alley MSAC analyses over this year. We are reviewing the results of these analyses to determine statewide needs and, and implications. We've talked about the 911 funding analysis, and in the not-too-distant future, we should have uh, awards as a result of our call handling call handling equipment RFP process. Um, so we've had a number of um, very significant accomplishments for activities in calendar year 2016. So looking forward to calendar year 2017, if we're going to um, uh, start the RFP process for the ESI net in 2016, we need to be thinking about uh, the awards that will occur in 2017. For those of you who have applied for a PSAP grant in 2018, I've already mentioned that we've had a number of NG901 GIS data applications. I, I anticipate that that uh, will continue in um, the subsequent grant application cycle for um, fiscal year 19 and, and 20. But we need to continue to leverage the PSAP grant program to identify to address identified funding gaps to, to the extent that we can. Mentioned that um, the um, deployment, uh, NG 911 deployment, would occur with um, uh, PSAP transition based on the selective router pairings, anticipating that the first region or, or the first area to, to transition to NG 911 would be, would be Northern Virginia. 
And after hearing all of the, the work that's gone into, you know, formulating all of the pieces and parts of the funding analysis and, and, and all of the various supporting activities for, for um, NT911, we need to evaluate the need for additional PSC staff, especially looking at um, ESI net oversight. And we do have a legislative agenda for 2017, but we need to continue to identify additional legislative changes, and we need to continue to educate decision makers because, as Steve mentioned in the beginning of the uh, in the introduction to the presentation, that this is this is a fluid process. I mean, the, the presentation changes every time I do it because we have new information, and I, I want to make sure that everybody's aware of that. But um, we also need to uh, make sure that we're educating our decision makers <clears throat> related to um, the uh, most recent developments. Moving on to 2018, continuing the PSAP transition based on selective route repairing. Certainly, um, it, it sometime in 2017, we would know what the queuing or the order of the transition would be with, with the pairs based on um, uh, the advice of a, a trusted partner that comes out of the RFP process. And, and then standards. Um, and I put standards here because one of the one of the um, items that uh, came out of the legislation from 2016 was to give the 911 services for ESI net and core NC 911 services standard setting authority, but there may be additional standards that need to, to be, um, that need to be um, um, incorporated. And we won't know that uh, until we have gone through uh, at least one uh, selective router transitioning. And if we're approaching this from a regional standpoint, we need to consider um, regional uh, governance in this. And then moving on to uh, calendar years 2019 and 20, and I just have a single item of completing the PSAP transition. Uh, based on selective router pairings, and, and this will this list will continue to grow. Um, it, it's not that all of our work will occur in 2017 and 2018. I expect to be extremely busy for 2020. Uh, but right now, um, we're not sure of the additional supporting activities that will be related to the the transition. And then moving on to the legislation. Um, with the General Assembly session from 2016, we renamed the e one Services Board to 911 Services Board, again, recognizing the, uh, the focus on the entire 911 ecosystem. I've already mentioned uh, the uh, standard setting authority that the board now has. Um, but a foundational step in terms of deploying the uh, next generation 911 is to define what it is that we, we mean by NG 911 and then also ESI net because this is this is the backbone. This is the IT network that will become our new um, our new infrastructure. And when we when we started um, discussing the 2016 legislative agenda, it was the result of the feasibility study that was um, completed in late 2015. And the feasibility study was undertaken for, for two primary reasons. It was undertaken to um, help overcome two limitations, the ability uh, to, um, to transfer a call, um, a 911 call statewide, and also to, to have um, faster call set up on. So those were those were two limitations that, that we recognized in um, in the current 911 system. But but the the overarching need that that's driving everything that we're talking about in terms of NG 911 is the fact that the analog network is is, is going away. Uh, so that was the the um, fundamental reason in completing uh, the feasibility study. And the fact that the analog network is, is going away hasn't changed 
Uh, we completed the study at the end of 2015. We are now looking at the end of calendar year 2016. So it's even more critical that we uh, we focus on uh, the planning efforts related to NT911 because those needs have not have not gone away. So looking at uh, the legislative. Uh, plans for 2017. We've talked about this in a number of venues to delay the recalculation of the PSAP wireless funding distribution percentages until July 1st, 2018. The reason for this is um, to allow um, the completion of the 911 funding analysis. This, All of the information that I discussed with the funding analysis will be available in a document in early December. Um, and this information is important because it will lead to the legislative agenda in 2018. And this will give us an opportunity with the completion of the funding analysis to socialize the funding needs that are related to NG 911 transition costs and 911 sustainment uh, needs to address the identified funding gap. So looking at the legislation for 2018 will be to focus on the funding gap for um, the entry 911 transition costs and 911 sustainment. We've already talked about the transition costs. Right now we're estimating a gap of about $42 million. And um, the, the next, uh, the last slide, we'll talk about ways um, that, um, well, actually, uh, on this slide, I'll, I'll be talking about ways that we can close the gap. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to be looking at the possibility of having to transition to NG number one within our or within our current means, within our current um, uh, funding, and and this will mean leveraging the grant program and looking at ways to be much more efficient and 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 figuring out. Um, what are our most critical needs and being able to, to address those. So in 2018, when we're looking at asking for additional funding from, uh, from the General Assembly to close the funding gap, there are a number of ways that we can consider in terms of addressing uh, this funding gap. We've, and, and the items that are listed here are not um, a finite list of options. It, it's simply a way of, of putting right now um, for this webinar, it's just a way of identifying what we have already discussed. No decisions have been made, and these considerations that, that I have here are, are a start. And as I said, they're, they're suggestions from the past. These, these are, are, are items that have come up in, in regional PSAP manager meetings. They, these are items that have come up at, at board meetings. Um, I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that the four items that, that we have here are, are the only options that we have in, in, in terms of, of closing the gap. At this point, everything is, is, is on the table. So, you know, in the past we've talked about the eliminations of, of transfers from the wireless fund that currently go to the state police and, and the compensation board. We've talked about the elimination of wireless cost recovery. Um, we've, we've looked at uh, in various committees how to change the current use of the wireless fund. And another suggestion has been to increase wireless, uh, to increase the 911 wireless fee or include an NG 911 fee in, in the communication tax. Uh, so right now, these items are, are just food for thought, uh, and we will, will certainly be having uh, much more in-depth discussions once the funding analysis is, is done. We know, it, we know exactly what that, um, that gap will be. We'll be looking at ways to address the gap. We'll also be looking at, at ways to, uh, to operate within um, our existing funding levels as well. Moving on to uh, slide number 18, the legislation for 2019 and 20. I just have a single item to address the outstanding, um, outstanding issues or, or new developments. So um, at this point in time, I don't know what they may be, but I'm certainly anticipating that there will be outstanding issues or new developments that will need to be addressed. 
And then this brings us to the, the final slide. Um, and and I want to close with this slide because it looks at our transition partners. And the, the success of NG911 will be based on having participation from all of the groups listed here because they represent the key stakeholder groups that we need to have at the table with, with our planning discussions, the State Corporation Commission, the carriers, the Virginia chapters of APCO and NINA, um, BNL and VACO, the Federal Communications Commission, the Vision Advisory Board, and even the Interoperability Coordinator, the FBOC, who serves as an advisor to the 911 Services Board. Um, we need to be working with these groups if we if we are to be successful. Um, you know, I I started the presentation um, by by laying out um, the the assumptions that that are going into the planning process. I talked about the funding analysis and and um, the supporting activities and the legislation. And I and and I spent um, a couple of minutes reminding everyone about why we did the feasibility study for NG911, setting up this entire planning process. And the fact that the analog network is was going away when we completed the feasibility study, it's still going away. And we're still, um, we still need to address the, the primary limitations in the current 911 network that were addressed in, in the study. But we believe that we have um, a solid plan in moving forward over the next five years. Certainly, um, ISC staff has been working with the Regional Advisory Council, um, but in addition to that, uh, these transition partners uh, will be critical to to ensure that that we have that we have a successful outcome. Um, as Steve said, uh, the planning um, the, the presentation changes every time um, that I do it based on, on new information, and it will probably be just a little bit different when I do the same presentation. At the, at the conference, but I've tried to keep it at a fairly high level for, for, for this go-round to make sure that we have time for questions, and uh, there's still 15 minutes remaining in the webinar, so um, I would like to ask anyone if you have any questions, concerns, ideas, um, or feedback to, to jump in and, and to share your thoughts with the group. Does this presentation uh, make you feel better? Does it make you feel worse?
no one piece app can deploy next generation by itself in a vacuum. We, we are ultimately going to make need to make sure that we all do this in a collective and concerted way to make sure that we get uh, to the to the ends as quickly as possible. And that being off of the analog TDM network, we don't have a choice here. Remember that we have a few more years, maybe five, maybe seven. Uh, to to migrate off the phone companies like Verizon, CenturyLink really haven't said when they're going to retire the TDM network. But by the same token, um, we've all experienced increased issues, whether it's trying to get additional maintenance or trying to get repairs made. So um, we do not want to be the last people on the existing network. We need to get migrated off of it as quickly as possible. So anything that you can provide to us, uh, information, assistance, that was a great suggestion about taking into account uh, the, the transfer issue among localities. Um, that wasn't on my radar before and is one we'll have to take into consideration to make sure that if you have a partnership with your neighbor that says, you're going to take my calls if I go down, we need to make sure that you're handled consistently or together so that that relationship can be maintained as we migrate into next generation 91 or we at least have a contingency during the transition to recognize that uh, during the transition something else needs to happen that you're not just if you go down oh well you're down and nothing more we can do about it so those are the types of suggestions we need those are the types of uh, blinding flashes of the obvious as, as my old boss used to call it that we need that we don't may not have thought of or the rack may not have thought of so uh, the RAC will be involved with this heavily. The board obviously will be. Please be involved. Stay connected. We know how much you have to do and how busy it is just running a PSAP or a GIS office day in and day out. But we need your involvement. One of the board's core um, uh, um, uh, beliefs, uh, uh, principles, is that uh, our guiding principles is that it, this requires complete stakeholder, full stakeholder involvement, um, and, and we absolutely do need that. So are there any last questions, comments, concerns, anything we haven't thought of, anything that you want the board to know uh, as we move forward, any concerns about the time commitment that this is going to be taking over the next two years to stay on top of all of this? Looks like Kay has another question. Sorry, can you hear me? Oh no, no, don't please don't apologize. I, I just have one question is that I think the biggest challenge that we've had here is finding a good common area for information as the NG nine one one process has progressed over the last couple years. And we seem to be really good at picking out various pieces of it, but do you have a centralized website or location or, or something that we can go to to check for updated information? Jane, most of the information related to NG911 um, can be obtained from the Regional Advisory Council webpage. Okay. And you'll see the various project plans. Now, one thing that will be occurring in the month of November is we have three uh, calls, uh, three RAC calls, and that will be focusing on finalizing the various components of the funding analysis. So I will be publishing that information on uh, the RAC webpage, and I'm also going to be sending out updates to the TSAP community. So you'll be getting um, um, several updates in the month of November related to NG911, but the, the RAC webpage certainly and then the feasibility study is available. Um, if you want to send me a quick email, I'll provide you with the link. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And then the other question I have is, how do we go about finding out who our RAC representative is? I'm assuming they're appointed through some form or fashion. Or is that a state-initiated group? No, um, all of the PSAP representatives for the Regional Advisory Council are available from the RAC webpage. Okay. Um, and there was a, a charter that was established that determined membership for all of the, the membership categories, so you can review that there as well. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for the questions. 
Any other questions before we sign off for the day? Hearing none, thank you all for participating. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your regional coordinator, Dorothy, myself, or uh, your regional advisory council member. Thanks, and have a great rest of the day.